Now, this is a really interesting story because he is backing the growing calls for descendants of slave traders from the UK to pay significant reparations to right historical wrongs. He's demanding that those involved in the transatlantic slave trade be posthumously charged for crimes against humanity. This is a big topic at the moment. It's being discussed around the world. Ghana President Mohamed Erfan Ali joins us live now from New York, where he's going to be addressing world leaders at the UN General Assembly on this subject later today. So we, we, we've got in early with you. OK, let me ask you a question, Mr President, um, on behalf of all of our viewers who would be covered by this. Why should somebody who maybe had an ancestor seven or eight generations ago, long before they were a twinkle in their great-great-great-great-grandparents' eye, why should they have to pay now for what an ancient ancestor did? Or why should they apologise for what an ancestor did centuries ago? Why do they still carry that burden? Oh, it's not a burden at all. You are one of the beneficiary of that uh, slave trade. So this is not a burden. You should uh, be concerned and you should uh, pay because you today are still benefiting from the greatest indignity to a human being and that is the slave trade. And not only did you benefit during the slave trade and your country developed, but look at what it caused the developing world. During slavery, resources was used to build your country, build up your capacity. You were able to then become competitive. You were able to invest in mechanization. And developing countries like ours were left behind. So you should be very concerned because you are a prime beneficiary of the uh, exploits of slavery. So put a figure on it, please, because it's all, it always comes down to the bottom line. How much, how much should an individual taxpayer in a country like the UK be signing a cheque to a country like yours, Ghana? Well, it's easy to calculate. We can use the time value of money. You can look at the, at the period of slavery and the contribution uh, that, the, well, not the contribution, the extraction of wealth from countries like ours and how it was utilized to build uh, your society, build your country, create wealth in your country, and then add the time value of money and you'll, you will get the value. There's, there's a lot of research paper on this. Uh, uh, a lot of universities would have done paper on this. There's uh, in, enough literature to tell us what that value is. But I want to say that it is not only the, the value, it is the loss of time. It is a loss of competitiveness. It is a loss of human dignity. It is a loss of our education system. It is the, is the culture that we lost. It is, a, it is all of this indignity that surrounded slavery that we must consider. I just wonder, people will be wondering what... Um, you explain that there are calculations, but are you able to say in what measure that would be? I mean, are we talking billions, millions? What would you expect the payout to be and over what period of time? Well, you know, this year in Guyana, we uh, commemorate the, the 200th anniversary of the Demerara Rebellion. And it took 200 years to get an apology from one of the families. I don't believe that the, you would want us to wait uh, 200 years for reparative justice and for us to take this conversation forward. CARICOM uh, would have set out a 10-point plan on what should constitute uh, reparative justice and what should constitute reparation. And uh, the calculation goes uh, into billions for the region. How far back, though, do we have to go on this? Because you make the point, we're talking exclusively here about uh, Western imperialistic slavery, to, 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 to summarise it. But almost every civilization on the planet owes its existence and its prosperity almost always to crimes in the past, be they aggressive wars, be they different forms of slavery involving different movements of population. You can go right back to the Greeks and the Romans. Why just target one particular era in history? Some would say that's the arguments of political convenience. It's, it's, it's a handy handle to, make your, I, to hang I, your argument on. I, I think you're doing a great injustice to compare slavery with any other uh, 
um, of, of the historical facts that you're mentioning. I was including other forms it's, of slavery. No, but I was, I was including other, other examples of slavery as well. To, to the indignity that slavery brought to people, that, that is the first thing. And I'll give you an example. Coming on to your program a few moments ago, you were speaking about uh, net zero mm -hmm. and cli climate justice. We are speaking about, uh, the world is speaking today about climate justice and compensation and how we address the issues of climate change. And this is the problem. We live in a very unjust society. You know, <clears throat> we condemn completely the war in Ukraine. But if you look at the mobilization of resources uh, in the war in Ukraine, in two years, you have mobilized more support for Ukraine than we have mobilized for Haiti for 60 years. You have mobilized more support uh, for Ukraine than we have mobilized for Palestine for 20 years. You have mobilized more uh, support for, um, for Ukraine in just uh, one and a half years than we mobilized to, to address the issue of hunger in Africa for three years. And that is the type of, uh, 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 you know, unjust way we have been dealing with these crises. And we are not going to tolerate the injustice that occurred during slavery to be compared with any other system. Slavery, we all agree, was the greatest injustice ever done to human beings. So we should not yeah. ever try to compare this to any other system. No. There is no other system that has created greater injustice than slavery and indignity to humankind and slavery. Yeah. President Ali, I wonder if I can talk to you about um, uh, another issue. In fact, you raise it there. Guyana discovered crude oil in 2015, and by some accounts, that makes your country the world's fastest growing economy and will be one of the largest per capita oil producers in the world by 2030. Um, what responsibility do you feel now as an oil producer amidst the warnings of climate catastrophe? Well, we, it is not what responsibility we feel now. It is the responsibility we have always held close to us. We have a forest the size of England and Scotland combined, with the lowest deforestation rate in the world at 0.036%. The entire forest is R3 certified, quality carbon, and this has been standing there forever. The question is, what has the world done with that standing forest? Is a, is a forest worth more dead or alive? So these are the questions. So we are not, we, we, we have always been a part of the answer. And although we are a newcomer to the petroleum industry and the oil producing in the, uh, industry, we have said very clearly that we support the removal of subsidy on exploration and we support a carbon tax. We also said that we support a balanced approach and coming on on this program, I heard that we are going to uh, go back on some of the policies even in the UK mm. uh, on, 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 on um, petroleum and, 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 and uh, EVs and so on. Yeah. So what is the balanced approach? Okay, the very, balanced very, approach go on. is how do we get the petroleum company around the table? This cannot be, we cannot go into COP28 with two extreme ends. All right, Everyone needs to be around okay, the Mr. table President, you, so you... we can have commitment from all the stakeholders. OK, Mr President, you make that clear very briefly now because we're, we're over time here and I know you've got to go and we've got to move on as well. But very briefly, coming back to where we came in, one of the points you're going to be making today is about our royal family. And you feel that um, it's not just about uh, the, the finances involved here in terms of reparations for slavery, it's about the gestures. And you think that the British royal family should make a big gesture, don't you? What do you mean? Hand over a palace to your country? Well, no, we don't, want to hand, we don't want the British to hand over a palace that we built. You know, if you go into many of the palaces in, in, in Britain, you will see the lovely green heart wood from Guyana. You will see the, the sweat, tears and blood of, of, of the slaves who were exploited. So what do you and, want? And the revenue that was, that was earned from their exploitation. So we are not asking for a palace. We are asking for justice and a fair form of justice to the ancestors, and to, the, uh, and to the greatest injustice that has ever done 
being done to human beings. We look forward we're to We're not your... going to. We're not asking for palaces. No. You can enjoy the palace, and when we visit you, we'll also enjoy it. Mr. President, we really look forward to your speech later on today to the UN. I'm sure there'll be much coughing and shuffling of feet, because when it comes to getting people to put their hands in their back pockets, you've got a mountain to climb. But. Uh...